good. What a savior. some adjusting done here still, so go ahead.
Thanks be to God. Well, as God has made us family, let's greet one another as family. High five, fist bump, hug, holy kiss. Welcome to Winthrop Street. All right, let's grab a seat. Take a load off your feet. <clears throat> Once again, everyone, welcome to Winthrop Street Baptist Church. My name is Grant. I'm one of the pastors here. It's great to have you here this morning. And this just, it's not a cold January day, but it just feels like a cold winter day. I don't know how to describe it. I think you all get it. But it's great to be together this morning few quick announcements for us uh, before we continue. We're doing a little lost and found today. This is a first for me. This is a nice, uh, let's see the brand here, get it right, Hurley Raincoat. I think it's men's. It's a medium. It has been sitting out there for months. If it's yours, take it. If not, someone else please take it. <laughs> it can't stay here any longer. So please take it. I'll put it right back out there. And if it's not there, I don't know. We'll find a home for it. But it's not staying here anymore. In addition to that, we're continuing our evangelism class, more importantly, after the service today, week number two, on sovereignty. So Pastor Pete will be leading that after the service today back in the children's church room. So I invite you to grab your coffee, snacks, and head on back there. A uh, reminder, we're doing prayer every Sunday morning, uh, 9 a.m. in the Children's Church. would love to have you come and join us in prayer for our time together in the morning. Uh, I've been up here the last few weeks, but again, another reminder, if you need your contribution statement for 2023, please ask Katie right behind me. She's happy to help you out with that or reach out to the church office. Probably will get Katie there as well ask for help on that. would love to, to guide you that way, to get you that information that you might need. And lastly, more a, kind of a housekeeping thing again today. If you are involved in children's church, today will be for second grade and under. So if you are third grade and older, you get to hang out here and listen to the sermon today. So second grade and under, you're going to head to the uh, toddler's room today toddler's room today. We've got a little unexpected illness for our teacher today. So second grade and under, head back to toddler's room, third grade and up, you get to hear God's word out here today, which will be fun. All right, speaking of God's word, we are in Mark 13, verses 24 to 37. So Mark 13, 24 to 37. Let's read God's word together. <clears throat> but in those days... After that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, and then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven." From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branches become tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away 
until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey, when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he become suddenly lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Lord, this is a good word for us on a sleepy winter morning to stay awake. God, it's really easy for us as sheep, to be distracted by the world and the happenings around us and wanting to keep blinders up and not face the reality of we don't know the day or hour. Lord, we need to stay awake. We need to pay attention. We need to not take for granted tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So Lord, we pray and ask you today that we will focus, that we will stay awake, that we will engage with your word, your gospel, that our hearts and lives will be moved towards your likeness in you, Christ Jesus. And if anyone's here that does not know you, I ask you, Lord, that today will be a day that they come to faith and repentance in Christ Jesus for life and hope everlasting. Lord, we do pray for Pastor Pete this morning, bringing your word. Pray, Lord, that you give him the proper conviction of grace and truth, that your gospel will go forward from his lips to our hearts. That will be your word and your truth that does a new thing in each of our lives, whether we've known you for a long, long time or a short while, that today will be a day that we learn more about who you are, all you've done, all you continue to do, and that the hope that we can have is in nothing except Christ crucified, raised, and ascended, and that he is returning. We thank you for that on a cold, quiet January morning. We thank you that there is hope in the gospel. We thank you that there's encouragement in the fellowship, and that there is a bond of peace in this place because of you and your work in our lives as individuals to bring us to a collective to worship and praise your name, Christ Jesus. Lord, we pray for many in our church family that are sick today, that are struggling uh, with simple illness or real uh, real health-related matters. Pray for relief for all of them, for healing, for comfort, for encouragement. Thank you for technology that allows them to watch at home. Pray that they can be encouraged as well. So, Lord, we love you. We pray that many churches in Massachusetts and the United States and all over the world will worship and praise your name today. That Christ is risen, he's risen indeed, and we rejoice in that truth and that many today will be added to your number that are being saved. God, thank you again for uh, the nine of us men that got to go up to this men's retreat last weekend and be encouraged and challenged in the, the world of just not being angry and being peacemakers. God, we pray that we all can be peacemakers in our lives, in our homes, in our families, at work, with friends, acquaintances, people we hardly ever see, people we see all the time. May we be peacemakers and be different because we are different in you, Christ. So, Lord, we love you. Thank you for loving us. It's in your name we pray, Christ Jesus. Amen. And if everybody could please stand, and we'll um, 
We'll sing out the gospel together. Kids to second grade can be dismissed to the back. Uh, so we're going to be in Mark 13 here this morning. When I was in middle school, my, there was probably like, you know, seven or eight other kids that were around my age. I was, I think, uh, sixth grade, maybe seventh grade. And me and my friends were referred to affectionately as the plague of gnats. And that's what we were, you know. Middle school boys are, are kind of like that. If you're a middle school boy in here, don't be offended because just look in the mirror. That's okay. And uh, one of the things that our high school leaders wanted us to do was to read the Bible. So to prove that we had read the Bible that was assigned to us, the chapter that week, we would have to draw pictures of what we had read. And, you know, I, and I don't remember who, who ended up doing this, but they decided that uh, it would be a good thing for us to read the book of Revelation. And if you're familiar with the Bible, the book of Revelation is filled with all these images of end times, eschatological, you know, visions of what's going to take place. And me, I'm not artistically minded, so my drawings were a bit abstract, but I think it, it goes to show that even as middle school boys who were rambunctious and all the rest, we had an interest in the end times. We had an interest in what God, God's word said would happen. And so here we are now in the second week that we're going to hear what Jesus says about the end times. And there are very few subjects that spark more interest than the study of eschatology, which is the study of the end times. I think all people, both believers and non-believers, are fascinated by this topic. And I think if we all admit, we're a bit skeptical also to what we see. And I think some of this skepticism is warranted because we see the terribly incorrect predictions of false prophets and forecasters. I mean, just being honest, I'm skeptical of the, the New England weather forecasts, so I'm also going to be skeptical about the people who say they know how and when the world is going to end. And you know, many people have predicted the world was going to come to an end. Currently, Jehovah's Witnesses have the Guinness Book of World Records for the most false predictions at nine, first in 1874 and most recently in, eight, in 1984. Some people thought the world was going to end in the year 2000. Remember that? Isn't that crazy? That was like 24 years ago. 
And even the New Age movement cited the Mayan calendars that predicted the world was going to end on, was it December 21st, 2012? You remember that too? Of course they were all wrong. Unless they weren't, I don't know. No, they were all wrong, for sure. And there are many others that have fallen down this same tragic path. Even this past week, the doomsday clock, you familiar with this? The doomsday clock, which is set by atomic scientists, said that we are still 90 seconds to midnight. Midnight is the apocalypse. So the trends that they cite are the ongoing war in the Ukraine, in addition to China, Russia, and the US spending huge money on expanding nuclear weapons. Um, that mixed with climate change and the dangers of artificial intelligence has caused this group of scientists to say, and I quote, leaders and citizens around the world should take this statement as a stark warning and respond urgently as if today were the most dangerous moment in modern history because it may well be. You see, even modern scientists prognosticate about the end of the world. And Jesus here is addressing the issues of the end times in Mark 13 in what's called the Olivet Discourse. Because we saw earlier in Mark 13 that Jesus is with his closest disciples on the Mount of Olives overlooking Jerusalem. Jesus was teaching his disciples and us to be on guard from false teachers and to endure through the difficulty that the end times would bring upon God's people. Now, what's interesting about Mark 13 is that Jesus doesn't tell us to set the dates. Jesus doesn't tell us to try to identify the Antichrist or the false prophet or the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Instead, he told us last week, and he'll tell us again this week, to stay on guard and to keep awake, and to be aware. And here are the three reasons for us to stay awake. Here's the first reason, if you're taking notes. Jesus will come for his people. The second reason is that Jesus will come soon. And the third reason is that Jesus will come, but only God knows when. So let's take this opportunity to pray for God to keep us awake, to hear God's word this morning. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you with open hands and open hearts, ready to receive the truth of your word. Lord God, we pray that you would prepare our hearts and minds for the truth of your gospel and the truth of your word that gives us salvation in you, Jesus. We pray, God, that you would help our minds to be not distracted by things, to keep us sharp and aware and awake so that we could be prepared and on guard at your coming. We pray, Jesus, in your mighty name. Amen. So Jesus will come for his people. And if you missed last week's sermon, let me remind you the way that Jesus is teaching. He's using the image of the destruction of the temple, which is what started this teaching topic in Mark 13, as a way to explain the events that will happen in 70 AD, when Jerusalem and the temple will be destroyed. And he's using that first century event to be the foreshadowing of the ultimate end times event, the judgment of God that will occur at the second coming of Jesus Christ. So Mark 13 is filled with prophetic meanings. So let's walk through it together, keeping in mind that Jesus has told us what will happen and that he wants us to be on guard and to stay awake so that our lives would be prepared for the coming judgment of God in the return of Jesus Christ, our Savior. So look at verse 24. Jesus uses end times language and imagery to describe what it's going to be like. Look at verse 24. He says, But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Look at that image. So Jesus says, in those days. The question is, in what days does that mean? It's the days after the tribulation. After the 70 AD destruction of Jerusalem, 
there will be cosmic and apocalyptic signs. The light sources that God created, the sun and the moon and the stars, will be shaken and darkened, not just from cloud cover on a dreary New England day, but as a sign of the ultimate cosmic upheaval and universal cataclysmic judgment that will be a sign that the end has come. Jesus is pulling on images from the Old Testament. And the prophet Isaiah used this same language to describe the judgment that God would bring upon Babylon in Isaiah chapter 13. Now remember, Old Testament prophecies, they have fulfillment in their time, in the future, and also in the ultimate future. So you don't have to turn there. Let me just read it for you. But you can look at Mark, Mark 13, 24 through 27, and hear and sense the same images. Here's what Isaiah writes. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising, and the moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant, and my law, the pomp, and, and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble, and the earth will be shaken out of its place at the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. See, what a, what a sight that's going to be. The sun, the moon, and the stars will be darkened at the coming of the Lord. The created order of the cosmos will be rocked and shaken as God Almighty prepares to come in judgment in the person of his son. And he's coming in judgment for sin. He's coming because this world is not how it should be. And so Jesus is coming to restore the world and to redeem the world, but also to punish the world for sin. And when we look ahead to the book of Revelation, chapter 6, verse 12, echoes this same idea. John writes in the book of Revelation, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanquished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. You see, this is the same image, the same description is being shown in these verses. The sky is going to be removed. The sun, moon, and stars will be darkened. And the physical world will be shattered as God brings about his final judgment. It will be like a heavenly earthquake. And star after star after star will fall as the universe moves towards destruction. The earth will be darkened and the moon's light will be too little to see. That's scary, isn't it? But not all is going to be dark. There's going to be one bright, shining light, which is Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, who will come on the clouds of glory. Look at how Jesus continues. Verse 26. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And this Son of Man is the same Son of Man as Daniel 7 describes, which we read in our call to worship. You can put that, those verses up there for us. Daniel describes and says, And behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed." See that? Jesus is the bright, shining light that will, be, that will come, that all will see. And Mark would want his readers to know this reference from Daniel 7, because Jesus calls himself the Son of Man repeatedly 
throughout his gospel. And in the history of redemption, the first coming of Jesus is the incarnation, which according to Daniel 7 and according to Mark, Jesus is the resurrected Son of Man who's presented to the Ancient of Days, God the Father. And at his exaltation, Jesus will receive all power, all dominion, all glory, and a kingdom that all peoples, all nations, and all languages will serve him and belong to him. And now here's Jesus in Mark 13, verse 26, saying that the Son of Man, who is Jesus himself, is exalted and reigning in heaven, and he will return on the clouds with great power and glory, which also echoes, echoes Daniel chapter 7, verse 14. This is going to be an amazing sight to see. So look at these verses again. Try to visualize them. Look at verse 26. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. So at the second coming of Jesus, what he does is he returns and then he sends out his angels who will gather the suffering saints who've done the work of Mark 13.10, which is to proclaim the gospel to the nations. And these elect believers will be gathered from all over the earth, from every corner of the globe, and will even be gathered from heaven as well. And the book of Revelation also gives us a preview of this event in Revelation 7, verses 9 and 10. John describes this scene. He says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So Jesus returns, gathers people for himself, so that, all, that his people would praise and worship him. And this is what we work for in our evangelism. This is what we labor for. You know, last week in the evangelism class, I mentioned a quote from John Piper. He's another pastor. He said that missions exist because worship doesn't. Missions exist because worship doesn't. So the purpose of evangelism is to encourage other people to worship the God of the universe. And these verses from Re Revelation 7, man, they're the end game where we see people from all tribes and nations and languages across all time gathered together in this end times vision of worship. That's what we're all working toward. And as great as our worship on earth is, it's going to be like nothing when compared to seeing the fullness and experiencing and praising God for who he is alongside fellow believers from every nation, tribe, and language. And this is what we're looking forward to, that Jesus will come again, and he's coming again to judge the world which means condemnation for those who don't believe in him and salvation for those who do. He's coming to gather people for himself and for, the, for those of us who believe in Jesus, it's going to be a great day of celebration, the coming of Christ. Because on that day, our Lord, the Son of Man, will bring to earth and establish the kingdom that he received from the Father, the Ancient of Days. And by our faith, in the work of Jesus Christ for us, we are included in this vision. Did you know that you are in the Bible? Did you know that? I mean, maybe you came to church today unsure of where you fit within the Bible or Christianity. But if you trust in Christ to forgive your sins by his work on the cross and through his resurrection from the grave, that Jesus has given us eternal life and access to God the Father, if you believe that message by grace, through faith, then you are in the Bible. You're in this picture in Revelation 7. It's describing people of all tribes, languages, and tongues worshiping and praising God. 
But Revelation 7 also describes our future as a church, too. And so our goal as a church is to be about this type of worship of God Almighty. So our goal is to build our worship as a church, as a church, as a body of believers at Winthrop Street Baptist Church, to bring our fellowship and our love for Christ here together. Because as a church, we're an embassy of the kingdom of God on earth, which means that our worship and our lives are to exemplify what we will experience in heaven with God. We want to live that way now so that people would see it and want to want to belong to the God that we serve and worship. So let's strive to be stronger together here at Winthrop Street. The second movement that we see is that Jesus will come soon. He now gives an illustration to emphasize what he's taught his disciples. And it's not a difficult illustration. He even gives the interpretation. But towards the end is where it gets hard to understand. Look at verse 28. He says, From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branches become tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So fig trees on the Mount of Olives were very tender at that moment. And Jesus is giving a perfect illustration. Summer is coming, and so they had to watch the details as Jesus described the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And there's an emphasis here on the nearness of the, of the coming judgment, the signs from earlier in Mark 13, show us that things in this world are moving toward the, the, catac- the climactic uh, event and end that Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, is near. He's at the gates. He's close, ready to storm the strongholds of sin and Satan and death and hell and the grave. But the most difficult thing for us to understand and interpret is verse 30. When Jesus refers to this generation, who is this generation? So some people think the generation who, it's the generation who would see the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Others think that it's the generation of people who are going to be alive at the end of history, who will see these things take place. My take on it is that I think based on the context of this verse, in the verses to come in the next section, is that Jesus has in mind his disciples. He says to them plainly in verse 29, he says, when you see these things taking place, you know that he's near. So remember, Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's talking to Peter, James, John, and Andrew. And that's why I think this generation can also be referring to his disciples. And I'll talk more about that in the next, in the next section. But we can be encouraged here about the power of the words of Jesus. Look at verse 31. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So look at what Jesus is saying here. The words of Jesus Christ are on the same equal authority as the Old Testament scriptures. And history has proven that Jesus is right about even the smallest of details. He's saying this world is certainly going to pass away, but God's word will never pass away. And there's nothing so true, so stable, so permanent, and so long-lasting as the very words of Jesus Christ, who is God Almighty. God's word is the foundation that we can stand upon forever. This is why Isaiah 40 verse 8 says, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. I mean, what, what can we stand upon when the world itself is caving in? Where's our hope? Where do our hopes get fueled? It comes from the very word of God. The Bible, which provides for us hope in the midst of difficulties and hardships. And Jesus says that the words I've spoken to you are spirit 
and life. Jesus' words are spirit and life. So if you're looking for true life and true purpose, then look to the words of Jesus, the Word made flesh, who lived, dwelt among us, died, and who rose again 2,000 years ago. His words never fail, and his power is given to his people through the Word of God. So let's be people who not only study the Bible, but who live by the Bible and who hope in the words of the Bible, which is the gospel of our salvation. The last final movement is that Jesus will come, but only God knows when. So Jesus continues to speak about his coming again. Look at verse 32. He says, But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. That's not a hard verse to understand, is it? Jesus says that no one knows when it's going to happen except the Father. Here's, here's the crux of the issue. Jesus adds the phrase, nor the Son. You see that? This is what gives us pause. Because we are faithful, Bible-believing Christians. We're orthodox believers, meaning that we believe in the full deity of God the Son, that Jesus is God, and as God, he has all the attributes of God, including that God knows all things, that he's omniscient. But here, Jesus himself says that there's knowledge that he doesn't know about. It feels almost wrong to say, but Jesus said it, so he's not wrong. And the only way to make sense of this statement is because of the Incarnation. That Jesus took on a human nature and entered into the time-space reality. And when he did this, he didn't lose or surrender his deity, but he laid aside his glory in becoming human. For a time, Jesus laid aside the, the free exercise of his divine attributes, like his omniscience. And in the mystery and beauty of the Incarnation, the all-knowing sovereign son could temporarily lay aside his, his God attributes so that he could live an authentic human life in submission to his Father and in dependency upon the Holy Spirit. It's amazing to think that Jesus limited himself while on earth. And this explains how Jesus could get hungry and be thirsty, could be tired, and could be killed. He was truly God, but he was also truly man. He, and he humbled himself to the point of not knowing the specific date. Well, let's look at it from a very human angle, okay? We can make a prediction here. Here's the prediction, that the Patriots will win another football game. I don't know when. Maybe not next year. Maybe not, I don't know. Do you think they're going to win a game next year? They don't play the Giants. But it has no effect on, that prediction has no effect on when it will happen, but on what will happen. The Patriots will win another football game. Unless Jesus comes back before then, but you know. But isn't that such an incredible condemnation on people who are caught in the speculation of when the world will end? Because Jesus is speaking with certainty about what will happen knowing that God the Father will take care of the when it will happen. So who are these people to set a date on the return of Jesus? Only God the Father knows. And so we may not know when Jesus will return, but we do know what we should be doing until he comes. Look at the repeated theme in these verses. He says, watch, stay awake, and why? Because we don't know when the time will come. Look at verse 33. Be on guard. Keep awake. For you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. 
Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. What does Jesus want from us? Stay awake. He tells his disciples and us to be on guard, to stay awake so that we would defeat the trials that we face and escape the temptations that we face. You know, in the New Testament, there's 260 chapters. And there's also 318 references to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Why? Why is there more than one reference per chapter to the second coming of Jesus? It's so that we would remember the main command of this chapter, to stay awake, to beware, to be focused. We don't need to know when it's going to happen, but we need to know that it will happen. I mean, look at verse 33 and 35. Jesus tells us twice, you don't know when the time will come. You don't know. I don't know. You don't know. Someone else doesn't know. The only one who does is God. It could be today, could be tomorrow, could be next week, could be many years from now. Regardless of the day, we know that we are one day closer to Jesus returning or we're one day closer to the day that we will die and then stand before Jesus. So what do we need to know and what do we need to hear from Jesus in light of that? Jesus says, stay awake. Don't fall asleep. Don't fall asleep. Jesus has left the house, but only for a little while. They should be ready at any time of the day, evening, morning, midnight, when the rooster crows. See, the hard part about this is, you know, there, well, let me think of it this way. You know, there's uh, apps on your phone. I don't have this. But you can download an app, and you can share your location with someone else. And they can always follow where you are. I think that's weird, but people do that. But we can't do that with Jesus. Like, we can't download an app and say, all right, Jesus is, you know, 15 minutes from coming back. Or like the scientists say, 90 seconds from coming back. We can't do that with Jesus. We don't know where he is, or or we don't know how long it's going to take for him to return. But we can stay awake. And we stay awake by following his words, by living out a life of loving God and loving others as we proclaim the gospel. Wait for the Lord, be strong and take courage and wait for the Lord. We don't know the day that he's coming back, but we know that he will be. And we want to be prepared for when he does. So Mark 13 is talking about the second coming of Jesus, but not only the second coming of Jesus. Now we have to remember that we're working through Mark's gospel during this last week of the life of Jesus Christ. So why would Jesus take this time to say these things to his disciples specifically at this moment? Why would Mark intentionally include this teaching into his gospel? How would this encourage the first century Roman Christians who are living in persecution? How does Mark 13 fit in and connect with Mark 14, 15, and 16? Well, let's look again at Mark 13, verse 35. Look at this verse again. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning. So, again, Jesus is directly telling the disciples that they are to be awake and not asleep in case they miss the coming of the Lord. And he says, evening, midnight, when the rooster crows, and in the morning. Now remember... Jesus has been talking about the destruction of the temple. We know from later on in Mark 
and from John chapter 2, that Jesus refers to himself as the temple. Remember he says, Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. He's speaking of his own body as being the temple, saying that his body would be destroyed and it would be rebuilt in three days. This is, I think, our, is our key for understanding the rest of Mark's gospel. So if you have a Bible open, look ahead to Mark chapter 14, verse 17. Mark 14, 17 gives us the detail that it's evening as a time frame. Now, I might remind you the order that Jesus says to stay awake in verse 13 of chapter, uh, in verse 35 of chapter 13. So evening is the time frame. Then we come to the betrayal and arrest of Jesus. Isn't that an abomination? Couldn't that be the sacrilegious action that Mark 13 describes that causes desolation like we looked at last week? That the temple of the body of Jesus is about to be mistreated terribly and is going to bring tribulation and judgment upon the very people who caused it. Look at Mark 14, verse 21. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Then we look ahead in Mark 14, verse 32 through 42, and what is that? The Garden of Gethsemane. And we see connections to Mark 13 again, because what does Jesus repeatedly tell his disciples in the garden? Stay awake. Keep watch. And what does Jesus repeatedly find them doing? Sleeping. And so the language is exactly the same. And then we come to Jesus being arrested, and where do all the disciples go? They flee. They run away, which is exactly what Jesus said people will do at the abomination of desolation. The people will run away. The religious leaders, they also didn't understand his coming either. They condemn him for blasphemy. And what does Jesus say in Mark 14, 62? Similar to Mark 13, verse 24. He said, You will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And while all this is happening, think of Peter. He's enduring a trial with the crowds and with a servant girl. And Peter denies Jesus and calls a curse on himself. And what happens? The rooster crows. Did you see that detail in Mark 13, 35? You think Jesus didn't think of Peter and the rooster crowing in this? And Peter weeps because it's like he's been asleep and his master came home and he wasn't ready. And then by Mark 15, verse 1, it's morning again. Jesus is delivered to be crucified, and everyone is still asleep, not recognizing and realizing the coming of the Lord. And then at the death of Jesus, it's Mark 15, 33, what does it say? There was darkness over the whole land at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Just as Jesus predicted, the sun and the moon and the stars would be darkened. And as Jesus dies, the curtain in the Jerusalem temple is torn in two, which is the end of the temple. There's, the need for the earthly temple is gone because Jesus Christ has paid for our sins. He is our sacrifice before God. Jesus makes us righteous because he takes our sins and gives us his perfections. And in his gospel, Mark presents the cross and resurrection of Jesus so amazingly. And his point is this. We aren't waiting for the end times. We're in the end times. They started with the first coming of Christ. Jesus has come. He died. He rose again. He sent his spirit. The last days are here. We're in them. The presence of the future has broken into this present world. This is why the authors in the New Testament, they repeatedly emphasize this theme. 
The author of Hebrews says, Long ago and many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. So we're in the last days. We're in them. And praise God, Jesus has given us everything we need. And so our encouragement is to stay awake don't fall asleep, trust in the gospel of our salvation, rely upon the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, and when he returns, that day is going to be a day of celebration. Amen? Amen. And we can echo what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, and it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you look carefully then how you walk not as unwise but as wise making the best use of the time because the days are evil this is god's word let's pray lord jesus we praise you and we thank you for your sovereignty over all things we praise you and thank you that Jesus, you've told us these things so that we would be prepared and that we would be ready. We thank you, Jesus, that you humbled yourself to the point of death on that cross where your body, like the temple, was destroyed and that we, by faith, can have access to God Almighty because of what you've done for us. That the the bridge and the, the, the chasm between us and a holy God because of, of our sin, because of the iniquity in our hearts, in our souls, the things that separate us from God, the things that are evil and dark and twisted are redeemed and ransomed because of your sacrifice for us on the cross. So Jesus, we ask that you would give us grace to trust in your gospel, to stay awake for the days are evil, the time is short, and Jesus, you will return. So Christ, shine upon us. Help us to see the light of the glory of the gospel in the face of Jesus Christ, our Savior. It's in your mighty and beautiful name we pray. Amen. could please rise and let's sing together our closing song.
close in prayer. Father, thank you for your word, for your truth, how it resonates and renews and does a mighty work in our soul. Lord, we all desperately need it, whether we want to admit that to ourselves or to you or others or not. So we thank you for this time that we got to sit at your feet and your word and to sing your praises and to fellowship with one another. Lord, we ask that you'll help us stay awake. Uh, we, we know that we grow weary and tired, brokenhearted, but you, Lord, are our rock, our cornerstone, that we know we can stand on on solid ground that will not be shaken. And we need that, God. Um, we are sheep and you're our shepherd and we trust you. So Lord, we ask today that you will help keep weary eyes open and tired hearts alert and souls humble enough to see, feel, and know who you are, all you've done, and all that you're continuing to do. And until that day, we will be awake and rejoice and praise your name and thank you each and every day. It's in your name we pray, Christ. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.